Hey everybody, uh, today we're starting the second session of the practice test. We're going to do the first three problems in this video, okay? So let's go ahead and start with the first one. It says, the number of loaves of bread remaining in a restaurant each hours after opening for the day can be modeled by this function. So we're starting with a certain amount of bread, and as time goes by, we can see what's happening here. We're losing bread, right? The bread's being used. What is the domain of the function? So remember, domain is the input just off the bat, okay? And they give us a, a series of values that the domain could be, and you can tell that the domain is not represented by an X, it's instead it's an H. But you can think of H as X and L of H as Y, right? This is a functional value. So it's saying that we're starting with, well, I don't wanna get into it just yet, but this is a linear function, right? So this is a lot easier if we, if we can understand how a linear function is modeled, right? And what this actually represents. So we know for every, every H hour, right, this is h, our value is going down by three and a half. This looks awfully like rate of change, doesn't it? This is our slope. And here's our y-intercept, actually. It's just written in reverse. We're used to it being written like this, right, slope-intercept form. They just kind of reversed it. So we're starting with this much bread. We're starting with 42 loaves, and we're losing three and a half loaves per hour. So it's very, very tempting to start and say, oh, well, we're going to 0 to 42, right? That, that's our domain. Well, no, it's not. Domain is what the values of H can be in order for this to work. Now, we know we can't have negative loaves of bread, so there are some restrictions to our domain, right? The lowest H value obviously can be 0. We can start at 0 hours. So that doesn't really help us. But we need to figure out what our maximum H value can be. We know the restriction is we can't have negative loaves. So what we can do is figure out when this stops and it's not quite negative, right? So I know if I plug in 42 for H, I'm going to get 42 times 3.5, and, and it's going to be far larger than 42, and it's going to be negative, right? We're going to get a negative value. That, that's out immediately. This is larger than 42. If I plug in 45.5 here and multiply it by 3.5, I'm going to get a pretty big number, much larger than 42. Again, it's going to be negative. Now, this one, let's check. I'm pretty sure that won't work, but let's just double check. So... Let's see here. It's three and a half. Can you guys see that? Yeah, right there, I guess. Yeah, there you go. Times 38 and a half. Oh, yeah, that's definitely bigger than 42. So we're actually, we can already tell immediately it's, it's part A. If we just understand that we can't have negative loaves of bread. Well, let's just test this out. Let's plug in 12 for H and see what happens. So we're going to do 42 minus three and a half times 12 and see what we get. So three and a half times 12 is going to give us 42. Right, so 42 minus 42 is 0, right? So this is perfect. That means we get to 0 loaves of bread, right? And that's it. If you think of this as a graph, right, it would look something like this. Like 42 would be up here for our functional value, right? And we'd be going down 32 over 1 for each hour, right? Let's say this is hours, right? It's going to look like this. It's going to be a straight line, right? Well, I, well, I hate when I feel it's a straight line. All lines are straight. But down here, it would be a 12, okay? The idea is that we're losing three and a half loaves of bread per hour, okay? And at some point, we're going to run out of bread, and that happens after 12. So that's really the main thing. The really, the, if you want to make this problem easy, it's to understand what's happening in the situation, right? We're starting with bread, we're running out of bread, and we can't have negative bread. If you know it's not negative bread, well, we can just plug these numbers in and figure it out. Although it's just easier, honestly, you can tell that these are going to be too big and it leaves you the first option. Okay. So once you know what's going on there, it's really not that bad. Okay. Some students freak out when they read that one. Now this one, this one's kind of a, uh, this one can be tricky. This one can definitely be tricky if you're not paying close attention. So this is number two. So I'm going to zoom in a little more. Okay. A series of transformations will be performed on a figure that is graphed on a coordinate plane. Which of the following series of transformations would, produ which would produce a congruent figure? So we need to know what congruent means. Congruent means same shape and same size. And by the way, the link to this test is in the video description, so make sure you're following along. I should have said this in the beginning. Make sure you're following along on the website, and uh, all my students should have a printed PDF of this, but if you're not a student of mine, and you're following along, uh, the PDF is in a link below if you want to print that up, and that way you can write down these notes. And the idea is that you have this, this book you can go back to in the weeks leading up to the MCAS, this packet, and it'll just help you 
refresh your memory of how these problems are structured. It should help you a lot, I think. So, okay, there's only three correct answers. There's five to choose from. That means there's two that are not correct, okay? So we have to look for transformations that will not lose congruency, okay? So a translation of a half unit up followed by a reflection of across the y-axis. So this is a shift, that's a flip. These both preserve congruency, therefore A is correct. Okay, a reflection across the x-axis followed by a rotation across of 90 degrees. So reflection is a rigid transformation as is a rotation, so it's a flip and a twist. Congruency would be preserved. Okay, now we start seeing that these three have dilations. We know one of them has to be correct. So I'll, I'll show you which one that most people are going to pick incorrectly, okay? A dilation of a scale by a scale factor of 2 followed by a translation of 5. So this, because it's a, um, the scale factor is larger than 1, so uh, bigger than 1, right? If it's bigger than 1, it's going to be an enlargement. Hold on, let's write it a little better so it's not so crappy, hold on a second. So let's use, oh, I don't know, what's, what's a good one to use for that? Let's see. We'll do R for scale factor. So if scale factor, if the absolute value of the scale factor is larger than 1, it's going to be an enlargement. Enlargement, let's try to make my handwriting legible. If it is in between 0 and 1, it's going to be a reduction. Now these absolute value symbols are important. They'll come into play in a moment. So this is definitely an enlargement. Right, so we're, we're growing the figure. And then it's shifting five left. So we never shrunk it back down. So congruency was lost. This is not it. Okay. A dilation of a scale by a scale factor of negative one followed by a reflection across the y-axis. So we know reflection doesn't change the um, change the size of the shape. However, a lot of us are going to look at this and say, negative one. Oh, it must shrink. It doesn't shrink, okay? Because here's the thing. The scale factor of one doesn't change its, change its size at all. And the, the sign doesn't matter. A negative one is, in, in terms of dilations, negative one and positive one are the same thing because we take the absolute value of that. So this is actually not changing the size of the shape at all. So this is D. Now, you, you may be wondering, well, what about this one? This is negative 2 and 2. Doesn't that shrink it and enlarge it? No, it doesn't, actually. This would grow it. This would grow it because they're both larger than 1 when you take the absolute value of them. So this is the one that people always, when they, when they do this problem, they always want to say, oh, well, this is a shrink. That's an enlarge. No, they're actually both enlarge, enlargements, so this would be out. So it's 1, 2, and 3. So this really requires you to have a really good understanding of what dilation is and how dilation scale factor works in order to get this right. A lot of students forget this because we don't spend a whole lot of time on this in, in geometry class. So pay attention to this part and make sure you understand how, how a scale factor works. Oh, by the way, if like, you think I'm making mistakes, let me know. It's very possible I do when I'm doing this. And if there's something that doesn't make sense to you, either check in with me if you're one of my students, and if you're not one of my students, or somebody else's, just, just ask. We're here to help, right? All right, so number three. Here we go. This is another one that I think this is actually one of the most deceptive MCAS problems since the MCAS became a thing in the early 2000s, and you'll see why. When I first saw this problem a few years ago, I was like, wow. <laughs> Just whoever made this problem was mean. So here we go. It's not hard once you, if you pay close attention, but it's so easy to make a mistake on this. A carpenter measured the dimensions of the floor in a rectangular room. He rounded the measurements to the nearest foot and recorded them below. So again, he rounded and he did to the nearest foot. So these are not the exact measurements. These are estimations. So it's an estimation problem. We had one of those at the end of session one. So the width is estimated to be nine feet. The length is estimated to be 15 feet, okay? Based on the rounded measurements, again, they want us to make sure we know that, which of the following statements could be true? So three of these are false. One of these could be true. Okay, the actual width of the floor is eight feet and four inches. So is that large enough? Well, we know the width, if we're gonna round it, it could be as high as nine, and 49, 49 hundredths, or 9.49, or as small as uh, 8.5 or 8 and 5 tenths. So it could be between those two values, right? If it's 8, oh, let me zoom in, that's way too small, sorry. If it's 8.5, it would round up to 9. If it was 9.49, it would round down to 9. So it's somewhere between those two values. Same thing here, we're going to have 14, 
five or fourteen and five tenths, and it could be as large as like fifteen. And, oops, that's not fifteen. Jeez, you can tell it's Friday. Forty-nine. There we go. So that's as big as you could get, right? All right. So could it be eight and four inches? Well, a lot of us would look at that and say eight point four, but it's not. It's eight feet and four inches. Okay, not eight point four and four tenths. No, no, eight and four inches. So eight and four inches is actually eight and four over twelve because it's four inches and twelve and a foot. And it's twelve inches and a foot. So did I say that right? I think I said it right. <laughs> There's twelve inches and a foot, and it's done. this eight feet and four inches. So this is actually as a fraction. This would actually be four four twelfths. As a decimal, this would be eight and a third. Right. The good news of this one is if you were thinking this was 8.4, 8.4 tenths, you would think it's too small, which it is anyway, so you're good. This is definitely not possible. But you'll see why that inches is, a, is an issue coming up, okay? And it's right here. The actual length of the floor is 15 and 5 inches. So when you first look at this, you're thinking 15 and 5 tenths or 15.5 because of the way it's written. But if you read it really carefully, and you pay close attention, you see, no, no, this is inches. This is 15 and 5 inches. So 15 and 5 twelfths, right? Which is just under half. So yeah, if I do 5 twelfths as a decimal, right? I'm going to put that in here. Let's see, 5 over 12. It's just over 4 tenths, right? It's like 4.42, okay, roughly. So it's going to be this roughly. This is an estimation, right? So yeah, it, it, it could be that. The length could be that because that would still round to 15. But most people look at this and they think, oh, they see the 15, they see the 5. They think of 15.5 or 15 5 tenths, which it's not. So this is actually going to be the answer. Let's see why these other two don't work, though. The actual area of the floor is 149 and 5 tenths square feet or 0.5 square feet. So we find the area by multiplying, multiplying the length and width of a rectangle, right? So you need to know that. Um, Let's see what, if we don't change this, let's see what it is. So 9 times 15 is 135, okay? Now if we round this up, let's say we go as big as we can get. Let's go with uh, 9 and 49 hundredths times 15 and 49 hundredths. So let's just multiply those together and see how big we can get this to be. Oops, so let's go with 9 49 hundredths times 15 and 49 hundredths. We get 147. So it's as big as it's going to get from the looks of it. So it's not big enough. So nope, can't be that. The actual perimeter of the floor is 44 feet and 10 inches. So <clears throat> let's go with the smallest one we could go with. So we're going to go, let's round this down to 8.5. So 8.5 eight and a half plus 8.5 and a half plus 14.5 and a half plus 14.5 and a half. Plus 14 and a half. And that would be the smallest perimeter. That gives us 46. That's how small it gets, okay? And normally if you do this uh, 9 plus 9 plus 15 plus 15, it's going to obviously be larger than that. It's going to be, what, 48? Yeah, 48 feet. So the smallest we can get is actually 46. This is not possible because these can't be rounded any lower. Okay, and perimeters you just find by adding them all together, right? If you have a rectangle, you know, length, length, width, and width, you just add those dimensions all together. So be really, really careful on this one. This one's really about, uh, can you really recognize the units? This is not 15 and a half, this is 15 and five inches, which is actually below a half, okay? So yeah, that one, that one struck a chord to me when I first saw that problem a few years ago when they released these. So okay, that covers the first three. Let's just do a quick recap. Uh, number one, right, we have to really understand how domain works and the limitations of this function, where our, our functional value could not become negative, right? And just by plugging and checking, you can actually do this pretty quickly. Number two, we have to have a pretty good understanding of how dilations work. Um, even though this is really about transformations and congruency, I feel like really the main thing is you understand what a dilation does. Number two, and number three, we really have to pay attention to uh, units of measurement and uh, estimation, really. All right, hopefully that was helpful, guys. Again, if you have any questions, please let me know. Thanks.